So I guess I just like pin it here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sweet. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, uh, hi. Welcome to the Digital Fireplace. I'm your host, Rebecca, and today we'll be talking about contemporary oral history making as part of a four-part series to answer the question, how can the practice of vlogging contribute to an understanding of the presentation of self in contemporary oral history making? In the last two videos, we have discussed how vloggers are people just like ourselves, using this medium to better bring you into the stories driven by their personalities and the roles that they inhibit. Vlogging is a front stage practice, helping confirm for a creator a portion of their identity and showing the context of who they present themselves to be. But what does it mean to show the narrative of not only one day of your life, but a great deal of your own personal history through this side of yourself? Let's get serious, guys. First, it would possibly be best to explain some of the key terms that are floating around my thesis question, one of them being oral history. I'm also going to spend some time showing the difference between oral history and oral tradition, which is more wildly understood. There's a key term in both of them, obviously, being oral. Oral, as defined by the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, is to be uttered by the mouth or in words. To also keep these definitions brief, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary also defines an oral tradition as the stories, beliefs, etc. that a group of people share by telling stories and talking to each other. And it also defines oral history as a recording containing information about the past obtained from in-depth interviews concerning personal experiences, recollections and reflections, and going hand in hand, the study of such information. And I want to define these things for you, random audience member, because I believe that vloggers happen to slip between these practices, the art of sharing stories with others and the recording of historical content of an individual's life. The idea of the oral tradition has existed for a large portion of human history, with practices such as poetry or memorized prose as a means of bringing forth information and entertainment through story to other people within your familial group or larger cultural grouping. Māori would utilise oral tradition when separate groups met each other, whether in peace or in war, with things like the pōwhiri or waiata, to welcome someone onto sacred ground or into their homes. We also had the haka, which is performed to show their strength and challenge those receiving the song and dance. Before language was written and composed on paper, we relied on the acts of recitation and memory to convey ideas to each other. But the creation of the tool that is the written word changed the way that we think and act. Although to some degree oral traditions did comment on history or a people, the formalisation to oral history as we know it as a practice began much later than our first known oral traditions. Oral history, in fact, relied on the tools of writing and recording to become the practice that it is today. The actual term oral history began appearing in the early 1940s as a means for the thoughts and lives of the elite or well-known to be recorded, such as politicians or policy makers of the world. It was about presenting forward the voice of things that would be in your history books. Lots of important recordings did happen around this time, such as the recordings of Holocaust survivors, a truly important perspective in our world history. By the 1970s, however, oral history practitioners were also interested in recording not only the things that would be in history books, but in collecting the voices of the many. Take, for instance, some of Kenneth Khan's thoughts in his book, Reconstructing the History of the Community. Oral history lends itself to the truth of personal experience and the life story. If the narrator is sufficiently perceptive and colourful, if the narrator can make his life bear upon others with the sheer force of his own reconstructed experience, then the oral historian needs no more than historical imagination to recognize the narrator and an ability to question with sensitivity and to edit with great skill. The channel Oral History Center on YouTube explains in their video, What is Oral History? that the interests of an oral historian lie in the everyday experience of a person, the eyewitness of their own lives. They want to understand the history of the person and how they came to be to better understand how they act as a brother or a sister or a worker or a friend. The thing that I found interesting when I came to my reading around oral history was that I couldn't help but feel that vloggers were already performing this function. They didn't need to be prompted by an oral historian to be interviewed, they were already speaking as eyewitness to their own lives and showing you as an audience. Now Khan wrote this book in 1981, 20 years before we saw the emergence of the YouTube platform and the new video types that came along with that large influx of internet savvy creative minds. What I like about Khan's quote is that although oral 
oral historians are interested in interviewing anyone about their lives, he still recognises the fact that someone with a little bit of colourfulness to them will sell a narrative that much more for an interviewer, much like how my interviewees described heightening themselves a little bit for their audience. In terms of my mood, I like to present happy and a good mood at me because of the fact that the theme is relatively like happy and every day. Like I'm not going to complain too much. They are both me, but it's kind of like if you're to get up in front of the class and present a speech, you want to have a different way of talking. Just like slightly different, but it's still you, but you're kind of trying to present yourself in a way the audience wants to see. Another interesting term that Khan uses in the quote is to edit. The nature of technology, social media, and the YouTube platform itself has kind of changed the way we think and it, we're more focused on garnering views and maintaining engagement. The practice of editing someone's video to keep people entertained is part of the course now and an integral part of the vlogging practice. Some people may agree that this alone makes it hard to be considered as a historical document, but for me it's only a natural development to a world of rapid change and device-led life. Sir John Goody, a very well acclaimed anthropologist, wrote in his book entitled Myth, Ritual and the Oral, he said it perfectly. He said, life histories do not emerge automatically. They are heavily constructed. So Khan and Goody help us to understand that orality and oral history are collecting, are constructed and edited, much like any text could be, even if what we're dealing with is the speech of man rather than the written text itself. But Walter J. Ong, who was an American scholar, priest and philosopher, was the man to coin the phrase secondary orality in his book Orality, Literacy and the Technologizing of the Word. Ong explains the journey of man through his beginnings as an oral culture to written and now seemingly back to oral but informed by the written world. For without writing we could not have developed our prowess in science and technology as we have and therefore the things we use to spread our stories, the sound of our stories such as the telephone, radio, television, they rely on the written world for their creation but with audio as the means of delivery. And that's what secondary orality means to Ong, relying on the world of the written to inform the delivery of the oral. To me, secondary orality is a great way to show our development in this device-led life, as I kind of mentioned earlier. The practices we have created in the past have to be willing to adapt and change to fit with the tools that we have now. To kind of explain myself, let's go on a tangent here and talk about America's Funniest Home Video. <laughs> As a kid with my siblings, AFE was always a fun option for all of us to sit down and watch together because one, it was obviously funny and two, it was just great to see people filming and just happening to capture something as it happened. This show started in 1989 where people would send in whole VHS tapes to the show to see if it would even get on there. It's a technology that's obsolete now but it was so special then. Home video recorders were expensive and special pieces of equipment that had to be handled with care. You couldn't just multiply these tapes once created. Once they were made, that was it. This was your one copy. My father had actually purchased one of these camcorders back in the day and our family home video was this precious historical document that we all love to sit down and watch and, and marvel at four-year-old Rebecca and six-year-old Mia. Things are normally pretty calm around our place. It was just a great time and AFV had that same feeling for us. It was harnessing what people enjoyed and watching themselves on the screen, but it created a format that made it special for not only your own family to watch on repeat, but for other families to also enjoy and laugh at too. And to think that this show is still kind of releasing more episodes to this very day, but instead of having to send in your whole VHS tape, the one copy you had, you can now just log in online and send it via the internet. <sighs> this may seem like overall a strange point to be making, but I'm trying to show you how as technology grows and develops, it, it creates a different kind of community and we learn new ways to relate and share experiences with each other. Here's the boogie girl. Dad! And you're coming too close. What? Go and stand back in the middle there. I suppose another point I'm trying to make here is that although oral traditions and oral histories are distinctly different, 
you can't actually have history without a storyteller to recount it. We construct our own histories and perhaps now more than ever we ask ourselves what is the important personal histories that we actually want recorded. When I asked my interviewees about this portion of my topic, they said that it was interesting to include the element of history. Although all of them agreed that vlogging doesn't represent all of the roles that they will play in life, they did agree that it is an interesting analysis of some of the roles that they play. For interviewee number two, he showed an immediate interest in this area and when I commented on how it must be nice for him to look back on some of this footage, he completely agreed and had this to say. Oh, it's awesome. It really is, it's so neat, because I occasionally look back at some of my old vids and go, oh, look at the kids, look how young they are, look how cute they were, and oh, I'd forgotten about that. And it really is, like you said, a way of writing history. And it's so neat. And the adventures with my mates and things that we did, I'd forgotten about, and we see a video and it's, oh, I'd forgotten about that mission, and, and it's really neat to have that form of, I guess, storytelling, isn't it? Well, it's not really storytelling, it, it's a story. Dr. Thomas L. Charlton, who was the founder and directing head at Baylor University Institute of Oral History for 23 years, wrote about his passion for oral history in his book, The Handbook of Oral History. The book also reflects not only on his thoughts, but also the practice itself and others utilizing oral history out in the field, some describing the act of using this medium as an embodied performance practice. Charlton's work has a beauty and passion to which you can see in his acknowledgement when publishing his book. We believe in oral history and its long-term significance as the means to transfer the past to the future through the voices of the present. We also believe in its immediate capacity to transform lives through the simple yet complex experience of people talking and listening to one another. Now it saddens me to say that Dr. Charlton passed away last year in July and it's nice to think, however, he's left behind a grand legacy with his writings and work as an oral historian. My hope is to bring understandings like his to the world of YouTube and the vlogging practice itself, to better inform it and prove its worth and research potential for those wanting to understand what it means to live in a world now and places like my beloved Aotearoa. It also saddens me knowing that our journey together in this topic is almost over. For next time, we will summarize our three episodes, bringing together fully the ideas of vlogging, the presentation of self and its combination to contemporary oral history. Have we allowed the tool of YouTube platform to shape our practice for too long? Can we change it to better reflect our own history and voices? Find out in our next and last video, Shaping the Tool of Vlogging. It's over then. Just one more. And then it's done. <sighs> oh, yeah, day three, finish. Uh, I hope you liked this video. Um, you know, this is a lot more work than I than I bargained for. Um, it's uh, <laughs> it's been great having you all. Please, would you like and comment and subscribe if you haven't already? Because this is this is um, you know, marked material. I'm getting nervous now. There's examiners watching me. Please tune in next time for Shaping the Tool of Vlogging.